What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy my channel, make sure you hit the like button and make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. We are closer and closer to 2,000 subs, and we have a giveaway. The quicker we get to 2,000, the quicker we give $250 to one lucky sub. So the quicker you subscribe and get us there, the quicker we do the giveaway. Uh, so make sure you do that now. I've got a special show planned for you today, and I'm really excited for it. Um, we interviewed Chad Marks uh, many months ago. It was a fascinating story. And I've came across a new friend, someone that I uh, really have learned a lot about. His life fascinates me. Uh, we're going to talk to an individual today that spent almost 24 years in federal prison. In 1997, he was given a life sentence. And he's here today uh, to talk about his life. He's become an author, a journalist. He's got a website. Uh, convictinc.net. He's a prison consultant. He's got a YouTube channel, which I'm going to display at the bottom here in just a minute. Uh, we're going to talk to an individual called Robert Rose Russo, uh, not Russo, R U S S O, Robert Rosso, R O S S O. Yeah. That's it. That's uh, it. We're going to get into his story. And, you know, I'm so fascinated by him. Robert, you've had so many interesting run ins and you spent a lot of time with the world of the mafia inside. Um, yeah. I read about you uh, in a New York Magazine article really quick. We'll just, we'll kind of tease this as we introduce you. Uh, You're looking live at this individual who many people would call a confidant of none other than Bernard Madoff. Carmine, you were a confidant of Persico's or weren't you? He was yeah. a friend of yours. Yeah, very um, close. We're going to talk about those guys. We're going to talk about Tommy Reynolds. We're going to talk about uh, little Jimmy Ida. We're going to talk about a couple of people today. Really get Robert's life. Uh, I, I urge you guys, this guy right here is going to have a huge channel. Mark that down. Go check out his YouTube channel, Convict Inc. Uh, Robert Rosso, what's happening? Good to have you. How are you doing, bud? Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, you, uh, you've only been on YouTube for a few months, not even, even been putting videos out for very yeah. long. And yeah. You're already making some moves. You're telling some stories. Um, you have a fascinating story, and I really want to start at the beginning. Sure. Uh, you're from California, right? I am. Originally. Um, yeah. If I get this correct, you, uh, your father was from Arkansas. Uh, yes. Why don't you tell us a story, kind of just a little bit about your kind of teenage years. How did you get into crime, and why did you go to federal prison? Okay, sure. So so my dad, as you said, he was uh, he was born and raised in the town that I'm in, a little town called Hartford, Arkansas. It was a coal mining town. Uh, grandparents left, went to San Pedro, California, which is the harbor area of Port of Los Angeles. Met my mom, whose family just moved from San Francisco, uh, working at the box office, and uh, they ended up having four kids. I have three older sisters and myself. Grew up an Italian Catholic family on my mom's side. I'm, I'm the 27th of the... Uh, 27 first cousins. Nobody has had handcuffs on them. Nobody's involved in any kind of crime. Uh, went to Catholic school in San Pedro. Uh, looking back on it, I was a spoiled brat because I was the youngest and only boy. Uh, got into surfing uh, young because uh, I grew up about a mile from the beach. And um, in that culture, you know, uh, a lot of marijuana. And I also grew up in the cocaine 80s where Coke was dirt cheap. And Coke was as common as pot, you know, uh, arguably. Um, and uh, I had older sisters that dabbled in that stuff. And um, yeah, so my life was uh, pretty much handed to me. And my dad was a labor union leader, um, business manager for Local 802, representative of the uh, Labor's, America, Labor's International North America. He was a California rep. So I was supposed to be him. And I just... Loved the whole drug scene and um, got into pot early, started selling pot when I was 15, Coke 17, and uh, was always going to clean up, was always going to, you know, get straight and, you know, become that labor's uh, leader that my father was. And this never worked out. Just uh, got busted early, um, had a bunch of labor's officials try to clean that up. And I just kept on and, and uh, you know, I, I did a lot of drugs. A lot of drugs. That's how it happened. So you asked me how I got to the feds. Um, 1989, I got arrested in Catalina Island for possession with intent to distribute small amount of coke, nine grams. I was bringing about a half key over at a time. Uh, well, sometimes nine ounces, whatever. Uh, out of that uh, arrest, I ended up ultimately getting a four year sentence. 
Um, got arrested in Arkansas for bringing coke from California to Arkansas. I did time in Arkansas over that because of those two strikes. When I got arrested for conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine in 1997, um, they offered me at the beginning five years. It was a, it was a drugs coming through the mail. So the postal service was involved, the FBI, the DEA, the local cops, they offered me five. I said, no, they offered me two. I said, uh, fucking the ass. I mean, sorry. That's what I said. And, uh, and I said that, and, uh, <laughs> um, you know, they said that we're going to enhance you, give you mandatory life. I didn't even know what that meant at the time. And honestly, um, I didn't really make any money dealing drugs until this the last time. And that was about a seven month run. And I made right under a million bucks. And what happened was I, I wasn't a meth dealer, but uh, I went to California uh, uh, pretty much looking for Coke or just whatever. And uh, I was getting meth for 3000 a pound and selling it here for 20. I can move five a week easy. I can move three or four keys a week easy. Coke was 12.5. I was doing it for uh, 25 in Arkansas, stuff like that. So it just, it just happened, you know, it's hard and, to stop uh, doing something like that when you can make such a huge markup. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, I just landed in it. And next thing you know, uh, um, they're telling me I'm going to get mandatory life. And in my case, if, if those of you who know the federal prison structure, the sentencing structure, uh, I was unique as in they filed an enhancement with my indictment. So usually that takes place, uh, prior to sentencing, after arraignment. In my case, I was arraigned under the 851 notice, which means the day of my arraignment, I can only get life without parole. If I'd have pled guilty, there was no deals, life without parole. If I would have went to trial, life and blew it, life without parole. So um, because I cussed the cops out, because uh, I was from California bringing drugs to Arkansas and wouldn't cooperate, and because there were so many people mailing packages, picking them up, they had a lot of numbers. So there's like 20 people they could have put in prison. You know, I didn't realize it at the time. I didn't even know what a conspiracy was. Um, that's what it was. I was able to, if I would have cooperated, I would have gave them big numbers. So, and then I was 27, had a bunch of cars, Corvettes, houses, and uh, and I was a, I was arrogant. And I earned my life sentence, let's put it that way. You know, let me, let me ask you. Um... Sure. You're, in, you're, you're standing there in the box that day, sentencing day. Judge says to you, life without the possibility of parole. You're 27. I'm 32. I'm still pretty arrogant. I got to sure. be honest. 27, <laughs> I was way more arrogant. Um, what is your thought process when you hear that? So were, judge, you just so, were you just so irritated? Were you just no. uh, – what did you think when you heard that? Did oh. you really process it? So I knew I, – I knew – going in what the outcome is going to be if I blew trial. So what happened was I wasn't supposed to be sentenced until August. So I went to trial on April Fool's Day, 1998. Wow. <laughs> yeah. you know, and I didn't even realize it at the time, to be honest. So it was like a day and a half trial. It was like, it was like a little, I got hung, it was a little, you know, little redneck <laughs> trial. Anyway, uh, I was supposed to get sentenced in August and I'm sitting there one day and I've been up for two days on pills, meth, and I was in the shower smoking a joint. This is at seven o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden I hear Rosso court. And I remember yelling, no, no, no. The, the state dropped those charges. You know, there's, and I heard there was a marshal, uh, the marshals that used to bring me to and from court. There was a, there was a girl and uh, I recognized her voice. And she says, Robert, get ready. You're going to court today. And I'm like, what? So what happened was there was rumors that I had all this money put away. Somebody in the jail said, and then I was going to try to escape during sentencing. So they locked the jail down and then they brought me to sentencing unbeknownst to me. That's what happened. I, I wasn't, I didn't know I was going to sentencing. However, I knew going to sentencing, I could only get life without parole. I knew without the possibility of release. So I knew that. So going in up two days on dope, I had a batch of wine in myself when I came back to look forward to. So that what I was thinking when I went in to see the judge, first of all, I walked into the courtroom and I, there's people from this town. Most of them are now deceased. And uh, they were there to support. My dad was a pretty popular guy in this town. Uh, they're there to support my family. And a lot of them were there to see me hang. You know, I mean, I, like I said, I was arrogant. Imagine having five Corvettes in a little small town, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, uh, ripping and running the roads. A lot of them were happy. Do you look back on that now and just ask yourself, like, I was just asking to be <laughs> caught, like, 
Absolute 100% begging. I was begging for it, right? Like if you're in, uh, you know, let's say you're in Houston or, or you know, New Orleans, you know, maybe you could blend in a little bit, yeah. but, you know, it's like Al Capone going to, you know, Butte, Montana. It's kind of. Well, there's, there's, there's 500 people in this town. Right. In the town, in the town I was living, there was, there was like six at the time. I mean, 600 uh, in the town in between us, there's 200. So yeah. And I know, and I used to come back every summer, so I know them all. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So anyway, yes, yes. I was asking for it. Uh, but to answer your question. So my mom was in the courtroom, uh, real religious lady, uh, rosary, you know, all the time. So she was looking for like a divine intervention. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I knew it was that there. No. So uh, hearing my mom cry when the judge was talking, um, I remember the judge saying, perhaps you studied the law. I have too. And went into this big speech. And I remember thinking, oh, yeah, I used to sit around drinking because I used to drink meth in my coffee. I used to sit around drinking meth in my coffee, pondering the law. That's what I was doing. I was I was talking to the judges. He was, you know, but what it, it felt. uh you know, when he said the words, it was like, uh, you know, I was like it, surreal, but I was so high and I was expected it that I just wanted to move on to back to the cell to drink mm -hmm. and then move on to the appeal process, which I knew I was going to win at that time. Yeah. You know, so again, uh, kind of in denial, pretty much in denial about the whole thing, really until I lost my 2255. And uh, yeah, so that's that's basically cool. what happened. I'm sure people are watching this, you know, 10 minutes in, they're saying, well, he got life without the possibility of parole. How's he sitting back in that town talking to us? We'll get to that in a little bit. So a lot of people don't know this, but we'll kind of educate them. You'll educate them mostly. Sure. Um, the federal prison system, when you are awaiting trial, you're awaiting sentencing. It's not like you're in the feds. They have you in local facilities. They're kind yes. of holding places. But what happens when you get your sentence, they send you to a transfer center, particularly in Oklahoma City, different right. uh, states. Uh, so you go to Oklahoma City, you know that you're going to go somewhere else. Could be anywhere in America. Um, they send you to this place, right? Nice. Here. Yes. Uh, Leavenworth. Yes. Uh, yes. We've heard Leavenworth. Obviously, if you've ever heard of the man, Michael Vick, Michael Vick went to Leavenworth, military prison. Uh, you go to Leavenworth. That's your first um, assignment. Now, let me ask you, you hear Leavenworth. Did you... Did you know anything about Leavenworth? Did you oh, know man. That it was this no. notorious place? Oh, yeah. I mean, you've heard. So I honestly thought that I was going to end up at uh, Memphis FCI, okay. which is, wow. you know, not far. So I got on the plane and they, no, they didn't. Let me ask you, just interrupt. I don't sure. want to interrupt. So you thought you were going to go to, to, a, to an FCI, which is kind of a lower end federal prison. It's not going to be your USP or yeah. your, your, your AdMax or something, but. So you you had never been in federal prison. Why did they send you to Leavenworth? Can you? Because I had life without. Because okay. I had life without parole. Yeah. Okay. So it was a life sentence. So I didn't know the day I left. I didn't know when I was on the plane. When I figured it out was, uh, you know, there was a guy there named Rory Gregory. He was from Arkansas, and he told me I was going to go there. You know, but uh, you know, it, it didn't. I didn't. It, it didn't think about it when I was on the plane. That the first stop was like uh, uh, Butner, or I think Butner, Virginia. And then they flew back around and went to Leavenworth and back to Oklahoma City. I think that was the, the, the flight at the time. So you were waiting. I, I didn't know until the end. I didn't, it, And it was like uh, when it dawned on me. So there was also an, uh, a, a pretty popular uh, infamous guy named uh, Mac McElhaney, who was a uh, high ranking Aryan Brotherhood. And he got off the plane uh, when I did and was put on the bus. And this guy was like they had everything but a mask on him. You know, I mean, they had it. He was going back to court. Uh, for a trial, he got, but they had a, an indictment uh, pending from a prison indictment for a drug introduction case. And he was at Marion or ADX. And uh, so when I saw him, they had some other high ranking, uh, not Emmy, but he was a, a Mexican guy from, from Arizona. And just listening to those two talk. Yeah. It, it, it got spooky, you know, and it, and, it, and it was like, wow, I'm going to Leavenworth. And when you see the place, and you feel it and you, the history of it. And when you walk in, so they open up this little door. It's like almost in the wall, it felt like. Um, it, you get this musty smell when you walk in the basement. And it's 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 crazy. You know, it, it was. And I had been to Cummins in Arkansas, which was not a good place. I had been to Chino in California. 
But to see and feel and walk in Leavenworth was something. Oof. Did it uh when you when you walk in there, does it hit you that uh you're probably never leaving? No, like, no, 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 it did not. No, no, no. Still didn't hit you. No, so you at you at this point, as you said, you were you were drug addicted, you were yeah. probably an alcoholic, maybe. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. So sure. you 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 probably a lot of that you were using that kind of masked the validity of the situation that you were in. Sure. So, um, you know, it, uh, there was a point in county jail where I was doing, getting meth every week. And I, so I stayed on meth a lot as I was yeah. fighting my case. You know, I was in my mind, I was like Johnny Cochran, Ethel Bailey. You know, I, I, I had it down. But uh, so when I walk into Leavenworth, uh, no, I was I was sober that day. Um, but uh, I just believed. First of all, that they, they, they never had any physical evidence against me. There was no phone records. There, there was literally nothing but some witnesses. And I just kept thinking, you know, this is, it's going to go away. Like, it's, I'm going to make it, it like life without the, it, it, it never, I never thought I was going to have it. You, you always, that, you probably uh, thought, right? Like, they're not really going to give me my, like, I'll, I'll get out someday. Like, they're yeah, not really going to Yeah, no, me. no, I, you know, the drug law, and I had an attorney tell me, I had one tell me that, you know, don't bank on the drug laws changing, but I was looking for different uh, appellate attorneys. Yeah. And uh, they would say, you know, it's going to be a while. One of them explains that how the pendulum swings every 30 to 40 years. And true enough, that's where we're at right now. And, uh, but I, it, I was going to beat it on appeal. Yeah. Was you, were, you were I thinking you were going to spend anything yeah. really. Yeah. You know, three, four years max. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. For sure. You know? <laughs> How about that? Yeah. So the, you go to Leavenworth, yeah. uh, notorious place, you know, look, I mean, look, look at this place. Does that yeah. look like a place? I mean, yeah. that looks like a, that would look yeah. imposing. So you get in there and one of your first run-ins is with this individual. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, John Stanford. Now, what I'll do is I'll kind of be the. We all know who John Stanford is, guys. Nineties Philadelphia. I actually just did a podcast on Mr. Stanford uh, and one of his underlings, John Vesey. But John Stanford was an old school Sicilian boss, uh, a lunatic. Okay, this is a guy that threatened to kill uh, Geraldo Rivera, George Anastasia, Kitty Caparella. This guy was a old school nut job he gets life tell me about john in prison what was your first run in with him okay so um the first day on the yard uh, I, I went out there with the guy from arkansas named roy gregory yeah. that i met in oklahoma city and um we walked outside it was great just to be outside it felt the prison was huge because i was in a little county jail it gets smaller after you're there a while yeah. but it was real big so i was out on the yard and uh we, we do a couple laps and we walk over to the bocce ball court, which is where a lot of the Italian guys hang out. And um, there's how John many were there there? Do you know a fan? Pardon? How many, how many mob guys were there at the time? Oh, uh, for sure. 10. Okay. Uh, um, Not a huge it, group. No, Lewisburg. When I got to Lewisburg. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so 10 guys. Um, yeah. Um, I walk. So John was out there. I, I had no idea who John was. And, and I'm, I need to put this out there. I was from the West Coast. And so I didn't grow up with 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 like mob in my life or in the backyard or hearing about it or reading in the papers. It was never a thing to me. If anybody yeah. was like Scarface, the movie, you know, so it was like the cocaine. But it wasn't uh, it, I was never infatuated with it. And I know a lot of people are. And I'm not I'm not knocking that or saying I'm just saying it, it might. So like the name John Stampa, even if it would have been like John Gotti, it probably wouldn't have been like too big of a, like, Oh, you know, at that time, you know what I mean? Yeah. For you, it was like, you were from California, which yeah. there's not, you know, at one yeah. point many years ago, there was a mob yes. presence, but it wasn't yes. pronounced like the Bonanno family, the Columbia yes. family. And, yeah. you know, like even in like, I'm um, you know Philadelphia area, like growing up, like you would see people on TV, they would talk about this person, you know, that person, yeah. but you're out there, like that the, they're, you know, Latin gangs that are more yeah. popular and that kind of yeah. stuff. So you didn't have much idea. Like no. it could have been any mobster. Yeah. Um, you, you wouldn't have mattered had, to you. Had, had no clue. So John uh, played, bo so I played bocce. My grandfather was from, uh, from Italy. So I knew about bocce ball. So I played a little bit, asked me my name. So he wasn't sure. Um, so I always kept my head, the nuts ball now, but it was a number one, you know, I did time in California. It was white, White guy from California, so this is you, right? There here. you go. Yeah. So go 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 <laughs> you you that one from? So yeah. So goatee actually was brown when I met John, but so I kept it a number one. Uh, so you know he's looking at me. He knows my last name's Rosso. 
He doesn't know what to make. He doesn't know, if, you know, that I'm a California junkie or whatever, because that's what the mobsters would say, you know, about me. Okay. So um, he didn't know what to think. So he tells me when we get done, hey, uh, we'll block you. And I said, be lower. He says, there's going to be a guy that's going to come bring, I'm going to bring you a little stuff. Like, you know, so that's how he put it. So I go in and a couple hours later, here comes a guy, uh, uh, gray hair, hands me a, a sack of stuff that you can't buy in the prison commissary. And that guy was junior Bradley, uh, from Kansas, Kansas city. city yeah. And he, yeah. So, um, and that junior, uh, inter guns comes and brings me and introduces me to Bobby Mana. Um, Hans Graw, which was the guy out of uh, St. Cincinnati or whatever. Um, that's where the guys I met that night. So that was my run-ins with John. John, so you, real quick, oh. you mentioned Bobby Manna, uh, yeah. an individual that's still trying to get out of jail, trying to get yeah. a compassionate release just a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, very high up in the Genovese family. Yeah. I would have to imagine in Leavenworth, John and Bobby were kind of the, the leaders of that car, you would you would agree? They were kind of the, the heads. Uh, um let me think so uh john yeah so bobby bobby was quiet well i'll tell you what bobby did every day got on the phone and stayed on so we didn't have 15 minute limits when i first got there okay so he would get on the phone early stay on the phone for hours and every night at nine o'clock i know a lot of people don't know this every night at nine o'clock exactly he smoked one cigarette every night <laughs> that was Total it control. yeah he did that was his thing very that. quiet guy, not too many, didn't, didn't do a lot of socializing, didn't do the chow hall. John did, went to the chow hall a lot, went outside a lot. Um, uh, John ran the commissary and uh, the warehouse at that time. So he did was, he really? Wow. He was, that, the guy. He, he was the guy, yeah. That was his, um, so on the outside, one of his big businesses, he had a wholesale distribution company, a food company up in uh Gray's Ferry or Philadelphia, right off the expressway. That's what he did on the streets. That's interesting. They put him in charge of that. Makes sense. Well, I'll tell you something else. Junior Bradley, who's who who had produce businesses in Kansas City. Yeah. It was his kids that supplied the prison. No shit. How yeah. about that? So the trucks would come in. So all the stuff that we couldn't get, I don't know where it came from. And I'm not saying this day it is, but I know that, you know. <laughs> How about that? Wow. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, yeah. you know, they, they put those guys in control because you know, on the streets, I think there's one thing that we've always made clear about the mafia on our channel and on, on anything we do. There are definitely killers. Okay. And John Stanford was a killer, but most of these guys are terrific businessmen. They have a ton of legit business. Uh, John had a huge wholesale company. Um, wow. How about that? So you would agree that John Stanford was kind of your, you know, the first real initiate, like he helped you kind of get adapted to, to life, if you will. Uh, okay. Well, well, I don't want to go too far because it's yeah. not like we communicated a whole lot after that. Yeah. You know, but, so, but he kind of helped you adapt once you got early in. Sure. There. But also, so those guys, they also watch and they also saw the crowd that I was associating with the most. And that would be, uh, <laughs> Known drug users, uh, you know, so um, so they kind of uh, okay, so the drugs that kick your ass. You they know? didn't know that they didn't say that, but they didn't know what to make, uh, because of my background, maybe mannerism, uh, stuff like this. So they're like, you know, okay, so he's with this guy, and this guy's a total stone cold junkie, but he's not with these guys with the dirty white boys who I end up becoming a part of. So they didn't really know what, what to make, but. Again, so it wasn't it wasn't like uh, you know I walked hung out with John and stuff like that. Now if I went to commissary and he saw me, he was getting me in line first just because of my last name in the beginning. You know, it's he, funny. I don't know if you've ever heard this term. Um, we we I've I've heard it many times. Uh, um, you were a metagon. That's what you were. You were uh, yeah. you were the American Italian. Uh, oh. John John was the old uh, you know oh, old school. Yeah, yeah, from, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. Interesting. So. He was the guy to know in Leavenworth. And it's interesting because John's moved around. I know John, I think now is up in Devons. I mean, he's very old. I mean, sure. Uh, you know, John is, I think, accepted of his fate. I mean, he's an old school gangster. He was never going to cooperate, never going to do anything. Yeah. So who else, you know, how long were you at Leavenworth? Uh, uh, your... um, so from September 1998 until uh, the end, uh, October of 2002. And most of the time, most of the time I was in the hole and that was drugs, alcohol, violence, fighting, 
um, stuff like that. And I, and I probably spent more, I did spend more time on the whole 11 more than in general population. And just to kind of build off that just a bit, you don't have to sure. get totally into it. You started running around with DWB. Uh, yeah. Right? DW, Dirty white boys. Yeah. Yeah. And they yeah. are a, uh, you know, a, a subset of, you know, kind of, I guess, bigger groups that kind of do work for other groups. Oh, uh, well, okay. So, like, so real quick, the dirty white boys were, uh, uh, uh were predominantly a, a group of guys from Texas that got contracted into the feds back in 1985. Those guys had formed a softball team. The softball team became known as the dirty white boys. And out of that, they formed a prison game. Um, some people will say they're foot soldiers for the brand. Some people will say they're nut swingers for the brand. There's a whole That's bunch of different, yeah. but at one time the brand was locked down. The dirty white boys had more numbers in the system than anybody else. Uh, also got one of the worst reputations in the federal prison system for sure. So they started doing the bidding for other groups that maybe weren't. Uh, able sure. To sure. And then, then, uh, I was there in Leavenworth when they took over all the brand stuff, uh, because the brand got locked down. There was only one guy. They made the move. That's what happened. At, and that prison at that time, I don't want it to get it confused. So yeah, got gotcha. you. Yeah. yeah. So in 0203, kind of the, the turn of the millennium, just yeah. after um, you go to Lewisburg. Yes. Uh, and you know, one thing we 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 can gather from Lewisburg, Lewisburg is in Pennsylvania, it's in the yes. Lehigh Valley, yes. uh, not very far from New Jersey, Philadelphia, New York. Uh, it is a haven for uh, people in mafia organizations, a lot of mobsters there. Yes. Um, so you go to Lewisburg. I want to kind of tell some of the, the stories that, you know, or you tell the stories. Um, and then we'll kind of get into your, your, your getting clean, going down and sadly getting cancer. Sure. We'll talk about that. Sure. But I, I want to talk about a couple of people. Um, this individual on the right, um, Thomas Reynolds. A lot of people know uh, Tommy T.K. Reynolds. Tommy was a Beth Avenue crew member, probably the most violent uh, individual in that group. Um we all know why Tommy's locked up. We don't need to go into that story again and again. Uh, he and another individual, we all know that story. Um, I've, I've heard something interesting about you and TK. Um, you would claim that Reynolds made the best sauce in the, the, the prison. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, okay, so that, the best that, gravy. Would, that, so that would be debatable. I, I guess uh, if Joe Money's still around, which was the Colombo guy, I'd probably debate that. But what do you say? Do you say he made the best? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And he wasn't and, even and, Italian. He was Irish. Yeah. And those guys, and, and, uh, well, he's mixed, is he not? Is yeah. He not? I <laughs> so, I, I mean, so, yeah. So, uh, definitely Tommy and Joe Monty at different times taught me how to, how to make it from scratch from, with tomatoes. But Tommy, every week, um, yeah. So, we lived in uh, F Block together. That's how I got to know Tommy and became very, very close. Yes. Yeah, and so let me let me and let me add. So I was sent to Lewisburg real quick. There was a I ended up becoming a member of the Dirty White Boys. There was a uh, gang problems between the Dirty White Boys, what's called the Air Resistance Militia, the Arms. Uh, we ended up being the group that left. We got scattered around. Uh, they sent five of us to Lewisburg, and we were the first white prison gang at Lewisburg since the 1998 DC yeah, Aryan Brotherhood yeah. murders. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, they spread us one of us in each block. And I ended up in F block and there was Tommy, Jojo Russo of the Columbos, Jimmy Ida, um, Joe Monte, uh, Joseph Russo, a different guy, Joseph uh, Russo. And um, oh, what was Chinatown? I don't know if you know who Chinatown is. Uh, click with, he was uh, another Columbo. And uh, the rest, there was two other whites because those guys would say Italian, not white. OK, so those were like two other whites and the rest was pretty much D.C. black guys. And you're talking about Joe Monte, uh, Joe Monteleone, yes. Colombo family moved yes. around with uh, yes. Andrew Mushrusso and those yes. those guys. Um, okay, so you're in Lewisburg. Yes. Um, your pal, Tommy Reynolds, a friend of yours, uh, he was running around with with Benny Geritano, as far as I know. Uh, yes. Be uh, Batista Benny Geritano. Just a little bit of background on Benny, a Gambino guy, an associate, uh, someone whose father we've actually talked about, Preston Geritano. Preston actually was suspected in killing uh, Gotti chauffeur Bobby Borriello. They had a long time feud. Uh, he ended up not uh, ever doing that, but there was a lot of issues with the Genovese family and Junior Gotti, who took over. They didn't quite respect Junior, and that was all over Geritano. Geritano would actually be killed by his own brother-in-law many years later after a fight they got in. But so Benny's in uh, 
<laughs> inside. A good wow. picture of him there. Yeah, okay. Um, I want you to tell quickly. You don't have to go into it. You had a great sell at Lewisburg. Is that correct? Pardon? You, your sell, it was like in the back, wasn't it? I I had what people, not just me, would refer to the best sell in, in that prison, which was yeah. sell 207, second floor, F block. Uh, F block was the smallest block, like 80 guys. Um, you know, so there's a third tier and there wasn't a good view. Second floor, all the way in the back, had a, a picturistic view. When it snowed, it was like a postcard, you know, beautiful scenery. And uh, excuse me, um, right next to that was a couple Latin Kings. And then Tommy and Benny were in the cell in front of that. That had so to be we, nice, though. To at least you have, you know, prison's terrible, but that had to be nice to at least to have a, a view. You know, that's. Oh, it was it was it, it, it meant the world. And oh, the, yeah. Plus, we hung out in front of my cell and uh, had a huge store. And so Tommy, Benny, myself, whoever my cellie was, and a guy named Dustin Burris, Dusty, who's another dirty white boy. That's the reason I got tipped up, dirty white boy. Uh, different story. That was that was us. As a matter of fact, I remember Tommy uh, at one point, like, like pretty much thinking this would never end. <laughs> you know? Like he'd never been any other places. And uh, I knew that, you know, you got to enjoy those moments, meaning when you when you have uh, a group like that, you're doing time like that. We did really we did really good time together. We had we were lucky to have such a good run together. And, um, you know, we all bonded really well. I mean, we were we were all we were real close. We were real close. Yeah, it sounds like you you were. I know, you know, you I've heard, you know, for, for as many things as you've heard about TK, you know, I, I know we've. I know I've heard many things, but th there's one thing about the Bath Avenue crew. I think that, that we can remember they were friends. They, they, had, you know, they were crazy from what I understand, but they all had a good camaraderie together. They were likable. I I'd have to imagine. So I can understand that before we move on from Lewisburg, I, I do want to quickly ask you about uh, this individual, uh, little Jimmy Ida, as you would. Call oh him. yeah. That's weird. It's, I, honestly, I didn't even recognize him. I was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So little little Jimmy, Jimmy real quick. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, little Jimmy was a consigliere in the Genovese crime family, and um, you know is really old school. Okay, he was the, the current boss of the family was in control, who's still the current boss. Mickey Domino Generuso was the underboss, and little Jimmy was the uh, consigliere. Now, little Jimmy ended up going to prison over uh, a couple of murders, Hickey Di Lorenzo, a couple other people. Jimmy was actually offered a plea. A five-year plea. Uh, he declined. He said, "I don't take right. fucking pleas." That's he right. told the rest of the family, and actually had considered doing things to other people that took pleas. He did not take pleas. He was an old-school guy. Ended up telling the feds, "Fuck off! I'm not taking a plea." Got life because of it. Um, so, little Jimmy, I want you to quickly tell. You've talked about this story, and you'll tell the full story on your channel, Convict Inc. But little Jimmy Eda was smacked. Somebody smacked the hell out of him, didn't they? Benny. Yeah, Benny, Benny did, and Benny. it was over. It was over my cell. So, what so you were the catalyst with, of that fight, really? Wow. Yeah. So what, here's what happened. So I was in that cell. Like I said, we we, we when, when you have when you're doing time like that with the close group of guys, you, like Tommy, you don't want it to end, okay? And we were all really were close. And I get what some people might think about Tommy by reading him and knowing yeah. him, and some guys that know him. I've heard a lot of things. That's cool. I, everybody's got their own opinions. Um, so I had a huge store in a big gambling operation and one night I drank. Okay. And somebody obviously that, I, that owed me a bunch of money, knocked me off by calling, getting on the phone and calling SIS lieutenant's office and having me breathalyzed. So I go to the hole, um, the unit team, I didn't cause them any problems. Um, at that time I was in a leadership position of the dirty white boys. I kept peace among, they, they liked the way I, I handled things, the staff, administration. Um, they used to get, you know, uh, I say that because when uh, like the, the Emmy guy at the time was Bobo, they liked, because we we cooperated with each other. I'm talking about us comics with each other. And we had a lot of really good peace on that yard. You're so they, they were really cool. Uh, so they knew I wanted that sell back. I got my cell back the first time, and then I went down again. Um, somebody, a, a guy that I knew, said that I had a brick dug out in the wall that I was keeping contraband. I was, and I got locked up. So when I went to go back in the cell, they put a guy in there by the name of Pino. You know who Pino is? 
Yeah, DeCalvicanti family, yeah. Okay, so Pino comes in. He just got a life sentence. He's like 70, I believe, mm -hmm. and also a friend of Jimmy Idol's. Yeah. And um, Pino was in the cell, and um, he was dragging his feet on moving. Now, if I'm 70 years old and I'm in that cell and I don't really know prison politics well because he never did get locked up, I'm not going to want to move either, okay? And then I'm really not going to want to leave F block because everything else was really – there was a lot of stuff going on at the prison, and it was a really mellow block. You can walk around, and, and I did, and shower should most of the time. Flip-flops, slippers, th that's really – so not boots. If, if, if you were doing time at Lewisburg, that was you I wanted was. to be there. Yes. Yeah. So, so Pino at one point was just basically like, like I'm not moving without saying those words. Him and my celly, which was a guy named Billy Bruce, got into an argument, and then Benny jumped in and got into an argument out on the yard one day. Benny gets uh, Jimmy Ida was supposed to be handling. Ben, uh, Jimmy Ida came to me and said, "I'll handle it. Don't worry, I'll get it." But time kept dragging on. Uh, you know, it went on and on. So Benny approached Jimmy. Jimmy was coming back through the metal detector. Jimmy said, uh, made some kind of a comment and swung his belt towards him. And Benny said, I don't give a fuck who you are. And bam, lit him up. And uh, and uh, the guy who was with, I can't think of who it was. I asked somebody about this the other day who was there. Uh, Mike something, he, he, he was mobbed up. He jumped on Benny and then Tommy Reynolds jumped on the guy to try to break it up. Tommy was just trying to break it up. Like, yeah. Hey, this is crazy. You know? And then, uh, they all went to the hole. Yeah, they did. So whatever happened with Pino, did he leave? Um, Pino did, he left that cell, but then the administration would not let me back. They wouldn't let me. you back in. Yeah. Damn. yeah. Okay. So yeah. interestingly enough, uh, two mate, you know, two, one heavy hitter and one, somewhat heavy hitter got into a scrap over uh, yeah. your cell uh, yeah. because you know, wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. What a life. What, you yeah. know, it's, it's interesting because th this is so different from, you know, our life, you know, you kind of forget uh, what goes on inside and all these different things that are going on, but that sounds like a pretty me mellow place. You want to be when you're inside, you know, you have everybody kind of follows the rules you, you know. at that time. Now, right around that time. Also, um, they, they, sent, they sent a bunch of Serenios and Emmys from Victorville. A lot of drugs at the compound. I'm going to tell you, for the first two years I was at Lewisburg, from 2003 to 2005, it was one of the softest prisons I've ever been in in my life. And, and, and that's a good thing. You know, it's not because a lot of guys are talking about um, the USP is a maximum. It was, it was really nice. If you're a, a drug guy, um, you're going to get drugs once every six months. Uh, you better have your money stamps as currency. Better have your money ready because it's gone that day. So as far as that goes, uh, so there wasn't – drugs usually bring a lot of problems. So there wasn't problems because of that. After the Emmy got there, and I'm not saying they caused it. So after the Emmy got there, shit started jumping for sure. In 2004, um, yeah. you got some really bad news. Yes. Um, you got cancer. Yes. Um, bladder Butter cancer. Heads. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I believe in 2016, your doctor mentioned that it was recurrent. Is that correct? Um, well, no, it's it's so I've had to date as right. I just had some removed last month. I've had 23 reoccurrences. Wow. So now uh, bladder cancer real quick. Uh, there's your bladder. If it's growing inside, if it's a mild stage, stage one, non invasive, it's like zits growing in the bladder. The problem is is if it stays too long or they don't get it out in a timely manner, it can grow in towards the muscle tissue. Also, if you have a lot of reoccurrences, your liner can get thin. And um, so uh, I'm good, but I, and, and that's one of the reasons we'll talk about I got out, but uh, I'm dealing with that situation as of right now. Not in a life threatening way, but yeah. So you had a pretty, pretty tough medical uh, problem. Um, yeah. Yeah. You go to Butner down in yes. North Carolina, which you know, is a medical prison. There's also yes. an FCI at, at Butner yes. as well. Yes. This is where some of your, and, and this is where your life changed, right? Absolutely. You, you get clean. Yes. You decide, like a lot of people, even Chad Marks mentioned this, he's doing stuff he shouldn't. He decides, you know what? I'm growing up. I'm becoming an adult. I'm a man now. I have to make the best of this. And I have to also try to say, you know what? Maybe someday I can get out of here if I wise up. And you did something similar. And I'll quickly just ask, because I, I have a major question at the end I want to okay. ask. You start running around in Butner with infamous individuals. 
But for you, I think we can I, – I don't want to say we owe them for where you are now because that's crazy to say. But would you agree that individuals like this and individuals like this were helpful in you wising up? Okay. Without a doubt, Carmine Persico probably had the biggest influence on me. And I'm going to tell you why. Okay, so when I first went to Butner, as you said, it was January 2007, and I was in uh, the hospital for 10 months. And I got more strung out in that hospital than I've ever been in my life anywhere. It was on pills. Uh, I had a cop on the take. As soon as I got there, I was getting cigarettes. I took the cigarettes, and I was trading for pills. So you got guys that were dying of cancer, and I was getting scooping up all their pills straight up. Wow. Terrible junkie move. And I, I can tell you worse things than that, but that's what happened. So I get... Trans, I get sent from the deuce, or I mean, I'm sorry, from the FMC to Butner One, and um, I get put right next door, a couple cells down from Carmine. Carmine knew who I was because I was taking care of Jojo Russo when he's in the hospital. Jojo Russo, uh, Colombo family, also Carmine's nephew, Andrew's son. Yep. And uh, yeah, so uh, Jojo Andrew is still alive, uh, by the way. Just jammed up last September, big case. But I go just ahead. heard that. Yep. I just heard that. So. Um, yes. Yeah, so I knew Jojo from Lewisburg. Uh, he was alive 17 days, died of kidney cancer. Uh, he went terrible. It was terrible death. Oh, that was horrific. Uh, anyway, I helped take care of him. Uh, me and a guy named Tommy Karate was, was there with me most of the time. But I You're going to just throw the name Tommy Karate out there like that? Like, Well, I'm just I, that, that's the truth because oh, Tommy no, was hold there. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sure. Look, I got to stop you. So just to put what you just said into perspective, Jojo Russo, big Colombo guy. Mm. He's very sick. Son yeah. of Mush Russo. Okay? Yes. Very sick. You are t helping Tommy Karate, who is arguably the most <laughs> violent killer in the history of Cosa Nostra. You and him are basically orderlies for Mush, uh, Mush's son, uh, Jojo. Quickly just explain like what kind of person Patera was. Oh, man. Uh, so Tommy doesn't take pictures with too many people. Yeah. I wish I would have even thought about it before I came on. I've got a photo of me and Tommy together. He asked me to take photos. I'm sure he'll so share that. Pardon? I'm sure he'll share it on your channel, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what kind of guy? I, I mean, honestly, he was like the nicest guy in the world. I, I swear, I've heard the stories about him. I would like let him watch my my grandkids. I mean, I, I know. That's, wow. I mean, like to me, really? Like, wow. Yeah. And I look. I get it. Uh, and to some people, uh, you, when you talk about people like Tommy Reynolds or Tommy Karate or or Carmine, Carmine who, yeah. uh, you know, people are like they they see like horns and fangs. And I've heard very similar things. Said man, these people. Yeah. to be honest, they're, I judge them by how they treat me and and how they you know and Tommy. Patera, wow. I mean, just such a gentleman, such a nice guy. And I know that's going to drive people crazy, but Jesus. I, I think that's yeah. something that, that we've tried to con, con, you know dispel on our show. You know, yeah. that we do, where we don't look at these people as like regal, like great people. But we have yeah. to remember, most of these individuals, they kill because that's their job. They don't enjoy. I don't think Tommy literally enjoyed killing people. That's just Which one? <laughs> Which one? Uh, well, but any of them. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they're like psychopaths. I don't think they're like serial killers, right? But I think at the end of the day, like I talked with Chad uh, Marks. He told me about John Carneglia, who was, you know, the chief hitman for John Gotti. I mean, he he killed many people. He said he's one of the nicest people he'd ever met, you know? And it's it's interesting hearing about them in this light because we have been told and we've read that how violent Patera was. Um, but it's important to distinguish Tommy Patera is not a serial, like he's not a so a psychopath, for instance. Like he doesn't enjoy killing people. It was his job. That was his job. Um, so uh you said orderly. I wouldn't say Tommy was an orderly. What Tommy did was he knew Jojo, so he would come up and visit in the evening. Okay. I was there all the time. And in, in full disclosure, I was there because of a nurse. I had a thing going on with the nurse. Okay. So um was I there to help Jojo? Yes. Was I there predominantly because I was sniffing around after this nurse? Yes. So I, I just want to be clear. But I'm sure you still, it was still instrumental late in his life to have 
someone. Oh, oh, so you know. so the night I found out he was there, I, I'm going to put this out there real quick. Me and JoJo did not leave. I did not leave Lewisburg on good terms with JoJo. And um, uh, we did not say goodbye to each other. But when I found out he was there, uh, the day, the, I'll tell you what happened. I was eating dinner and it was Greg De Palma, Matty the Horse, Tommy uh, Karate, uh, Sal, uh, uh, Fat Sal's. What, what, uh, Fat Sal Scala. Thank you. Scala and Philly Black, I think was the other guy. And uh, we were all eating dinner and a nurse comes up behind and she says to Greg, hey, Mr. De Palma. Hey, Mr. De Palma, do you know Jojo Russo? Jojo Russo? No, I know Jojo Russo. I know Jojo Russo. You know, that's how Greg talked. So I'm eating and I'm on pills. <laughs> and I turn around and I said, you mean Jojo Russo from Lewisburg? She's like, yeah, you know him? And I said, yeah. Anyway, long story short, Tommy pushes Greg upstairs because Tommy knew Jojo did too. I went upstairs with the nurse. And um, that's how I saw Jojo and uh, Jojo didn't want an orderly around him. He didn't want anybody changing his catheter, uh, showering him. And uh, I, I took on the job. I did it. And uh, yeah, it was, it was humbling, you know, even though, uh, you know, like I said, we didn't, we, we left not in the best of terms, but yeah, sure. It was, and it was to see a man's life in like that was, yeah, it did something to me. I was there the morning he died. Like I, I prepared his brother was coming and his family was coming for a, a an in-room visit and I used to get like you know anything from the commissary you can I'd set up little little stuff for these guys or the family to come in try to make it as nice as possible so this that, is your your what late 30s me yeah early 30s. uh so that was in 2007 I'm 52 right now so uh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah so um and like, I didn't know, like I later found out who was there visiting. I didn't care about that. So I, I heard his mom was coming one time and I just, so I was trying to make the room as nice for the family. Right. So Greg would come up with me that morning that Jojo died. We went up, it was me, Tommy and Greg. It was just three of us. We went up there and, and uh, I did my thing. I got, you know, Tommy helped me karate, uh, put out stuff for the family to come. And he looked good. He was real bright eyed, bad sign in the cancer world. And, uh, when we walked away, Greg looks, Greg says, he's at the end. I said, what? And he said, did you smell? You know, it's an ammonia smell kind of. And I didn't, to be honest. We went downstairs, count time. Before count ended, he passed away. So wow. when I go to when I go to the, to the one, I, I, I was kicked out of the hospital because they, they thought I was having a relationship with the nurse. I go to one, and then I end up in a unit with Carmine. Uh, at the time, I was heavily strung out on opiates, pills, and I was getting a prescription of uh, a Percocet. So I know Carmine and those guys, Carmine, Joey Testa, and a guy from Philly named Danny Cosi. They called him Cosi, Danny Cosarelli. Uh, Cosarelli or Cos. I, I, I think Cosi is his name. Those three. So they're, they're not they're not drug guys. So um, it was I was tired of of letting pills like control me, and. Uh, and I remember Carmine saying, right when I was winging myself off, he can see the difference in me. You know, you get the sweats. And when you've been on opiates for almost a year and you, you pull the plug, you go through some changes. Yeah. I remember Carmine saying, you know, Robert, you just seem like to, to, you, you, the, the dirty white boy, the druggy thing. Because I, I don't deny or hide anything from people. I don't care who you are. And uh, as a matter of fact, I let him know straight off the bat, hey, listen, this is who I am. This is what I've done, blah, blah, blah. And Carmine said he didn't care because I helped JoJo. Um, he just said, I, you don't fit this, 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 you don't fit that image. You know, you're too good. At, I hope you get your life straightened up, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Uh, so Carmine Persico, if I was around anybody else that period of my life, more than likely I would have relapsed. I have re hold on. I want to say I did three years, seven months and 20 something days clean before I relapsed up at Butner too. And many times I have over the years, Suboxone, a uh, uh, drink alcohol. That's, you know, I haven't done drugs in a while, but I've drank. So I just want to put that there. Um, yes. Me changing my life, uh, becoming a writer, um, 100% influenced by Carmine Russo. As for Bernie Madoff, the reason he was instrumental in my life is because he ended up at Butner and I was able to start. Um, I had a little blog called convictink.com at the time. And uh, people from uh, the, the post, New York post, were sending letters into inmates to give information about Bernie and they were offering money up to $500. And uh, I started outing the reporters on my blog. 
And, and anytime that somebody would report like Bernie did this, Bernie got beat up. No, he didn't. He really did fall down. Yes, his injuries were consistent with somebody getting beat up, but he, I, I, I know somebody was next to him. He fell. The blood pressure medication wasn't right. Um, when Bernie first got there, he didn't want to take any medication. So the urologist uh, guy named Dr. Ogle came to me and said, hey, I know your friends with Madoff. I read your blog. Do me a favor. Tell this guy, make him take his medicine. Talk to him. And I did. And he did. So, yeah, um, Bernie. Uh, oh, so my point being, Bernie put me on the map as far as writing. That's how Bernie helped change my life because I was able to write and with his permission and his wife loved it and, uh, you know, wanted me to keep going. That's so let me let me ask you about Bernie. How, how do you meet him? Like, how does that happen? OK, so uh, I'm in the law. I was a law library clerk. I do legal work. Uh, only one in, in Butner at the time. And I'm in the, doing my job. And, and uh, there was a guy named Abdul Muhammad that I've known for a while. Uh, and it was us two in the library. And we look and all of a sudden <laughs> there's Bernie Madoff walking with his bedroll going to laundry. And he had the biggest smile on his face. He looked like he was going to Disneyland. It was a great. And I remember Muhammad saying, Ain't this a bit like, God damn, look, I would be happy if somebody stole six, took $60 billion from me. And it was, we laughed so hard because this guy came in and he was just like, man, like the happiest camper in the world. I've was, heard that Bernie Madoff was, was free of, of it. He, he had that lie for so long that when he got to prison, it was just like, you know what? That's off my shoulders. I think he obviously lives with much regret. I mean, there's truth to that. His son killed himself. I mean, he, he stole tons of money, but maybe in a way, you know, going to prison was his release. You know, he got, he didn't have to worry anymore, I guess. Yeah. Um, you support, and he knew. Uh, so I didn't, I did what was supposed to be the first interview of Bernie Madoff. Now, what happened at the time was he was doing an interview for a book. I forgot what the name of the book, but the lady who, the author, released excerpts like two days before my interview was supposed to go up. Also, I was going to do it on my blog. I ended up hooking up with a guy named Steve Fishman who became a friend. But um, uh, things happened with New York Magazine where Steve did phone tapes and he released phone tapes of Bernie, which overshadowed anything I would have done. I was a little salty for a while about that, but uh, uh, I lost my point. Oh, I'm sorry. I totally lost my point. You talk about Bernie and, and meeting him. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but but the 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 one on one interview. I, I think I was saying that that's what overshadowed. Okay, so that overshadowed. But that's he put. My point being is he put me on the map as far as writing, and I said that twice now. But I kind of just got lost on. on no, that. that's. I mean, that yeah, obviously. Yeah, I got scattered there. Sorry, guys. No, all good. Yeah. that was kind of integral in, in kind of yeah. getting you to where you are. I, yeah. I want to get into your how you got out and all that stuff. I just want to sure. while we're on the subject of these individuals, you were kind of the guy that you were the ear, eyes and ears. You knew what was going on down there. I want to play a little game of you. Sure. Myth or not a myth about Butner. OK, you want to play this? This Go is ahead. what we heard on the outside. Go ahead. Is it a myth that Bernie Madoff cornered the hot chocolate market? One hundred percent true. 100 percent true so he went yes. to the the commissary buys up all the swiss miss and starts selling it man and and i did i did a podcast i was an interviewed for a podcast with fishman about this i think it's ponzi supernova and that and i didn't that 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 part took off and let me tell you what happened so bernie worked in the prison commissary yeah first of all they bounced him around so much and it was because staff either wanted him they wanted some knowledge of stock stuff or they hated him and he was getting screwed at the beginning uh they put him in commissary and uh he came up with the idea to buy all the hot chocolate. I mean, it wasn't possible because you had limits to buy every box at the time, but he tried to get close. So guys run store in prisons, two for one. You know, if you if I buy, if a candy bar is a dollar on the store, you sell it to a dollar fifty or front it to them. And they give you, you know, or give them one candy bar, they give two back, however you guys want to do it. Bernie, if I remember hot chocolate was 20 cents a pack. That's what it would have come down to at the time. I forgot if they sold it in boxes or individuals, but I think it was individuals at 20 cents and Bernie would sell it for one stamp. And I believe a stamp, that's what was currency, was 35 cents, I think, at the time. This is a guy that on the outside was yes. worth yeah. billions of dollars. So Bernie awesome. one night, Carmine wanted some hot chocolate. 
And it was 7.30's pill move. And that's when everybody goes outside and guys are doing drugs. They make their drug moves or contraband moves, whatever. People go out there for 10 minutes and mingle. Pill guys go up to pill call. So uh, it was me. And, you know, I've said this two different things. It was either Stevie Mialakis or, um, or Gabrielle Della O. Because there's two different times this happened. But the one time what I was talking about, and I think I told them it was uh, Mialakis and it was Della O., uh, we went outside. Carmine says, hey, can you go get some hot chocolate? And I had to go see somebody else. There's a circle of people around. And Bernie's in the middle like a crack dealer. And he's literally slinging hot chocolate. Boom, 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 getting stamped. And I looked at him. I said, Bernie, if I, I'm going to contact the media. He said, contact Inside Edition. They're paying the most. $10,000 for this. <laughs> hey, it was hilarious. But it looked the only thing he was missing was a gold chain, you know, if he had the gold chain around. But he was, I mean, it was, it wasn't just that he was doing it. It was in the manner of which he was moving. It was like, I don't have, I mean, it was literally like, boom, boom, boom. You know, like guys are grabbing, all right, all right. You know, it was, it was crazy. It was okay, crazy. There was, um, there was a story that came out of Butner that the way Persico and Madoff met was an inmate slapped Madoff and Persico stuck up for him. Is that true? No. No, okay. not, not, not whatsoever. How do they meet? You were there, right? Hospital. I was there. So it was uh, me and Carmen both had a, uh, the three of us had call outs. Now, Bernie was sent to, uh, we lived in uh, Georgia Tech and Bernie was sent to Clemson unit. Clemson was actually the nicest. Wait, wait, hold on. They have, that's what they call it there? Really? Pardon? The, the units are called like colleges? Yeah. Yeah. The state, fuck, I never state Virginia, that. Georgia Tech. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah Duke. Cool. Do no way. Rick, Forrest, Rick Forrest, all of it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Bernie was in Clemson and that Clemson was really, I don't know what it is. It was the best. And okay. So there's, there's two, there's two halves of the yard. So there's it's split by a gate. Uh, there's the bottom half, which the housing units are in a horseshoe. And if you go up the hill, but where the hospital is, uh, the units kind of go this way, you know, around. So um, Bernie lived in Clemson. We lived in Georgia tech and, uh, Carmine, when Bernie first got there, he'd have some of the, we call them kids. They were the younger New York guys. He'd have some of the kids go send Bernie stuff, care package, shoes, stuff like that. But Carmine would not go up to Bernie and meet him. He's too proud, whatever. He, he just wouldn't do it. Bernie was a celebrity. You know, everybody's on him for different reasons. So they just didn't cross paths at the time. So it was close to a week. I'm going to say a week, maybe a little bit more before they actually cross paths and met. And what had happened was we had medical call outs, call out, meaning um, you have to be at a medical at a certain time. Call out is a piece of paper. They'll say, you know, Russell report at two o'clock, Persico two o'clock. So you got to be there at a certain time. So we go up there. We had no idea that Bernie was going up there too. And, and um, 10 minute move, they locked the yard. The last person to come streaming in was Bernie. Carmine and I are sitting down. Uh, it's me. There was a guy named Eddie. I forget Eddie's last name. He was actually Joey Testicelli for a minute. Eddie, Carm, uh, myself and Carmine. Bernie walks in, he sees Carmine, and he walks up and, yeah, hey, Mr. Persico. Uh, the exact words, I don't know how they, but it was, hey, Mr. Persico, my name is Bernie Madoff. Nice to meet you, Carmine Persico. It was like that. And and at the time, it was, there. I, I do remember thinking, like, wow, you know, this is history for real. Yeah, it, is. it was really amazing. And the guy next to me, Eddie, who was from, uh, the hills of North Carolina, real country, country boy, doing 15 on a, on a meth case. I remember he looked uh, later on. He said, Rob, did you see that? We just got to see Bert Persico and Madoff. And I mean, you <laughs> could have sold that picture. Honestly, hey, honestly, yeah, yeah. So that that was something. And uh, yeah, that, that, that was definitely, definitely something. Sure. One more myth or not a myth. Carmine Persico is a control freak. Is that a myth or not a myth? <laughs> oh, uh, no, nah, I wouldn't say that was a myth. Uh, so no. he wasn't going up and just changing the channels on TV and he, yes. pulling people's no, 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 food no. out of the microwave? Yes. I mean, no, he, he was. I got into fights over it. I've got, I actually had two physical altercations over Carmine. So he I, think he kind of ran, like he was kind of, it, I want this now, and this is how it's going to go. Instead of the mob boss, he was the pod boss. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. I mean, for listen, sure. Because the sure. thought on – I've always had – like, Carmen to me, has always been – like, he lived up to his nickname. He was a manipulative snake who was obsessed with power that he would never relinquish it, no matter where he was. And it's fascinating to hear that he yeah. was – 
pretty much the same person. So yes, yes. So um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, for sure. Because I remember a time. So look, when I first got there, I had been in so much. I've been in so much over TVs that that Butner was like being in it. It was like it wasn't. It was like being locked in a college campus. You know, um, Butner's a prison that there's a, is a lot of gang dropouts. There's a lot of people that snitched. There's a lot of sex offenders. But all in all, like nobody bothers anybody, or at least didn't there. Yeah. So. At first, I didn't like being there. You know, it was like I was out of my element. You know, I was around all the less desirables. And where's the, the action? Yeah. Sure. Uh, and I always say there's about 50 good guys, probably not that many. 20 guys that had you can pass paperwork checks, never really did bad stuff. Okay. So um, Joey Testa was there, and he was the one that controlled the TV for Carmine. Whatever Carmine wanted, that's what I, Joey didn't really care about the TV as much as I didn't care. I liked the news. And at that time, I was really into my political awakening. And I used, I used to like to really watch the news a lot. So when Joey left unexpectedly, like he's like, you got to do this TV thing now. I'm like, oh. So we had a set schedule. And really, it was Carmine's TV. Yes, for sure. It was Carmine or the crew Carmine was with. And um, so, yeah. And the tape, the, nobody else had a table in Butner, only Carmine. And I remember saying that those, like, those things cause headaches. They cause stress. And I remember telling him like one time we're outside, Carmine, what, who cares about the TV anymore? It's like, I just don't want these other guys to get it. <laughs> so yeah. control, man. So yeah. Um, now just change the TV. If, if Carmine did go up and change the TV, which he has, but usually other people did it, but that was, they knew it, there was, there were set schedules. So before the beginning of TV season, for example, like especially Joey, or car, they'd say, okay, go talk to the guys and let's see what everybody wants to watch. Yeah. At the end of the day, it was going to be what Carmine wanted to watch because nobody really cared. And, you know, but it was always like the news stayed on from like five to seven, then inside edition. And then, you know, so it was, it was a set schedule, except for like maybe Saturday from, from 12 to five that other people can watch it. You know, I'm curious, um, what, what news were you watching in there? The local news, uh, CNN, because we could not get Fox. Uh, we would have watched Fox both, but as the warden told me, we don't watch that stuff here. That's a quote. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So were so, you, let me ask you, where were you, I'm curious, where were you when uh, Mr. Trump was elected? Oh, I was at, uh, I was at Terre Haute. Terre Haute, yeah. Terre what was that? Give me one word to describe the feel when, when you hear that. What was it like? When Trump got elected? Mind blowing. I think we all have like the, we. It's almost like we always will all remember that, like that night, right? Oh man, yeah. So uh, we most of the guys unit stayed up all night, and you know, you, you really had a. It was really first of all, it's kind of racially divided, yeah. you know, um, and it was, and it was. Uh, you just didn't know going into it. It was crazy, and and I used to. I used to say, look, uh, I've been following this stuff, and I think that that if Trump gets into office, he'll get more done than Hillary would because the Democrats, historically, even though they look like the good guys, I like started painting out pictures of things that they've done as far as the sentencing. Uh, you know, we can get into we can go all the way back to Ted. There's Kennedy. a reason I mentioned Mr. Trump, and I'll, I'll get to that. Sure. So uh, yeah, it was it was it was crazy, and I and I got on the Trump bandwagon. Um, uh, I'll tell you the truth because I follow politics so heavy and I know there's going to be guys that, that were with me for two of them for sure. They're going to watch this and they'll tell you, I said that the reason Trump is going to change sentencing laws or push for it. And I thought that there'd be more actually is because he's going to want to court the racial votes for the next election. So I thought he was going to want to do, and he really did push the that first step. His, that was and I his thought that, yes. And I thought it really for, for none other than he was going to need to court uh, when when he gets elected, you know, yeah. obviously you're, you know, you're, you're looking at never getting out, right? Yeah. In 2016, you're at Terre Haute. That's the last place you went. For anyone that doesn't know, Terre Haute is the place you go on death row. You didn't yeah. go to that area, but you, yeah. that's Terre Haute. Uh, so he gets elected. At that night, you know, let's say the morning after, do you have an awakening and say, wow, you know, maybe Donald Trump will be the reason I get out of prison. If Hillary Clinton, I'll ask this, if Hillary Clinton wins instead of Trump, are you here talking to me today? You think? Because her husband was instrumental in 
creating those draconian drug laws. Yes, and because well, and because okay, so so depend if they would have got the House and the Senate too. Yes, I would be here today. Also, I did have some inside connections, uh, meaning uh, I told you my dad was a big wig in the labor union, but the guy who really runs it, I'm not going to put his name out there, knew Obama. I was supposed to get out during the Obama administration. And you know the reason? That's why I have a wife from Spain sitting in the other room today is because- I've met her. She's very nice. Thank you. She was supposed to, uh, We I was supposed to get out because I knew somebody who used to go to the White House frequently. And my, my, my clemency petition didn't go through the pardon attorney's office. It went to the general counsel's office. They came back and said, hell no, we can't let him out now because I had 25 shots, violence, all that. Yeah. But, but at the end of the term, we're going to let him go. Now, what happened? The Keystone Pipeline. The labor union needed the Keystone Pipeline for jobs, 40,000 expected jobs, blah, blah, blah. And Obama didn't do it. So when he reneged on the, I guess that's the right word, on the, on the deal, what happened was uh, the guy that I know blasted him, who's a hardcore Democrat, went on Fox News, blasted him, and within... Seven days, I had a rejection from the general counsel's office. True story. So that happens in the Obama administration. Donald it, Trump gets into, into office. The First Step Act 2018 is enacted. And what this basically is going to help with is getting nonviolent drug offenders that have long prison sentences out of prison. Okay. By this point, you're a journalist. You're writing for a guerrilla convict. You're writing for Vice. You're, vi you're writing for The Fix. You're writing for all these different places. Um, you're at Terre Haute. Um, you're probably a, a, a perfect candidate to get out. You'd yes. helped yourself. You'd had yes. cancer. You'd still kind of you know, had health problems. Yes. So in early 2021, you go before the court with a motion to reduce your, your sentence through the First Step Act. Tell us about that. Did, were you, did you feel OK about it? Did you think it would go your <clears> way? How did that how did that happen? And then tell me about the first day you, you ended up getting out when that was. Sure. OK, so here's what happened. So um, the first step back, as you just mentioned, what it did first, that was the, the that we noticed the most was it reduced mandatory life to 25 years. It reduced mandatory 20 to 15 years. It also made retroactive portions of the crack law that were never uh, uh that were never made retroactive before, meaning if you had a crack case and you were convicted uh, pre-2007 or whatever it was, you now can go before the court and the judge can let you out. That they did not run um, the changes in the law retroactive, meaning mandatory life, mandatory 20, that was reduced to 25. It is not retroactive. So right now there's about 3,000 lifers still stuck in there. What did change is a portion of the, um, the compassionate release statute. Now, prior to this, you had to go through the Bureau of Prisons to get a compassionate release. What the First Step Act said was you can go through, you have to first file to the warden, then you go through the administrative remedy process, and then after the administrative remedy process, you can go to your sentencing judge. And not only are some of the criteria that you have to be sick, but for other extraordinary and compelling reasons. What is extraordinary and compelling? Okay. Well, even though somebody else got the credit for it. Arguably, Chad Marks came up with an argument that um, allowed me to get out and other prisoners on extraordinary and compelling. And the first case was called Cantu out of Texas. Chad did the case. Chad deserves all the credit for that, not Sean Hopwood. I'm going to put that out there anyway. So Shout what? Shout out to Chad. Yes, absolutely. Chad Marks did that. Um, so when I read Cantu and I realized that the guy was getting out based on his health problems, based on rehabilitation and other factors and other factors, that is that mandatory life is no more, even though it's not run retroactive. I said, bah, like the light went on. I, I am a jailhouse lawyer as well. I've been successful mostly at administrative remedies and warrants, um, but I've, I've done a lot of legal work and I'm like, OK. Then COVID hits at the same time, and the courts were allowing inmates out based on COVID under extraordinary compelling reasons. So I file a pro se brief. I fell out of the Western District of Arkansas, very conservative court. Um, I, I had a good, good feeling 
Uh, my judge was no longer there. And the guy that's up there right now, his name is Timothy L. Brooks, that took over my judge's case, that, that let me out. Uh, very, he's, he's very thorough. And I knew that because what I do before I file a case is I research the judge up and down. And I was like, I got a shot with this guy, you know? And um, he was responding. The problem was, is he was responding in, in about 10 to 14 days and denying everybody. No, but to this day, I, I don't even know if anybody else got out of my district. He hasn't let anybody out that I know of. A month went by, two months went by, three months went by, and I started sweating. And then I started getting really depressed. And then one day, uh, you know, the Bureau of Prisons on that COVID lockdown, I get out of my cell. It's all, it's, it's so, it's so stressful in there right now. I go to the phone. I, this, this young kid from St. Louis cuts me. We started arguing. I hear yelling, Rosso, Rosso, Rosso. And it was the case manager wanted me. And I went downstairs. There was a big line of guys and they were mad because I cut the line. She was wanting me. Um, uh, I went inside. She wanted me to shut the door. I didn't want to because I don't like to be in the presence of staff without shutting the door. I'm just trying to run it all down. I shut the door and she says, uh, listen, pushes the button. Boom. And it's my former case manager. Her name is Mrs. Boo. That's her real name. Said, Rosso, uh, your sentence just got reduced to 25 years. Now, I couldn't comprehend that because on compassionate release, you don't get a reduction in sentence. OK, not typically. So I was just like my brain wasn't allowing me to figure that out. And then and then I'm like, what? And she says, you're getting out. And I had to grab a chair like I my, my knees went I out. Believe you know? it. And uh, and it was just like, wow, man. And, you know, like the, the, my, my case manager, young female and you miss booze, a female. So they, you can hear them crying, you know, because they've never seen this. And then I'm tearing up and I'm just shocked. And I was like, they said 25 years and, it, and it's registering. I've already got that time in. Even take away all my good time, you know, everything that I lost, even though I technically never lost it because I had life, I knew I was going to get out. So I went to the phone and I called uh, my wife who was in Spain and I told her, you know, we won. Wow. I'm getting like emotional right now thinking about it for real. I bet. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. did 23 years, eight months in one day. You got <laughs> out April 13th, Man, I, didn't, I, I didn't expect that, Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, I, I, uh, yeah. Wow. I could only imagine. I, yeah. I, I, I'm only 32. Okay. I, I think about when you went inside prison, I was like eight years old. Yeah. I think about all that time I became a man. I, I went to high, all this stuff, but all that time you were in prison. Right. Yeah. And yeah. this happens. You call her and look, I met your wife. I, I talked to her for maybe 30 seconds. Yeah. Robert, salud. Good for you. That's amazing. I, know. You, I, know. I look at your life. You, you've, yeah. you figured it out. So, you get out. Mm. I gotta ask, what did you eat? A pizza. <laughs> was it a chain so, pizza? Was it like a? a it was an. It was like a, in Terre Haute. I forgot the name of the place, but it was like a real Italian pizza spot. It was thin crust though. And See, it, the that, guy, that's good for you because Chad Marks told me he went to fucking Pizza Hut. No, no, no. So, so the guy who picked me up, it was because I was just spit out, you know. Yeah. And the guy who picked me up was somebody. So Marty, my wife used to come visit me before COVID every about every six months. And she befriended some people that owned a taxi cab business and there were religious people and he came and picked me up. And there's a video of me when I get released uh, that you can see on my YouTube channel. It's like the first one. And he's the one that recorded it. And yeah, I uh, saw that. I saw yeah, that. man. And his name was Steve and a uh, real great guy. And uh, he picked me up and then they brought me to a hotel where my friend Brent uh, got me a hotel for the night. And then he came and picked me up from Arkansas. And I went and stayed two days with him before I came to see my family. So you see your wife for the first time. What's that like? Well, she didn't come for four months afterwards because okay. she wasn't a citizen. What's the first? So the, the first meeting of you two, how, how did that go? Oh, man. So I went to the airport in Little Rock, uh, got permission from my PO, of course. And uh, um, it was just so we've been, you know, held each other on visitation. But to see her, it was it was just it was how to explain it. You know, uh, it, it was crazy. And uh Good or bad, and I don't know if that's good or bad. We kind of felt like we've always been together, you know what I mean? And I don't know if that's, you know, you know so whatever. Let me we ask joke, you. We joke um, about that, so. Are you able, like, you're not able to leave the country? Um. So, that the, well, so my, I haven't had the conversation, but am I? I I've known, I've known uh, one, two, three people that have within their first year. 
So, well, but eventually you'll be able to. Oh, sure. I've got a 10 year probation tail, but so I, I also started a legal assistance company, which you'll talk, whatever. Yes. Uh, so um, it's one of the things I haven't done one yet. I got three partners involved with that. So one of the things is early termination of probation. And there's, there's, there's actually a criteria that you have to meet for it. Um, my, my probation officer is not familiar with it. We haven't had the discussion. I'm not, I'm not even thinking about that. You're right just now. working every day to kind of. Yeah. Like yeah. So and, I, and... I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to, you know, I'm going up there. I, I told my PO he's going to be my best friend when I got out and I, everything that I do, any kind of important decision, pretty much, uh, you know, let me ask you, um, this uh, is just a random question that I have. I'm curious. Sure. You spent all that time. Whenever you do something now, do you think very deeply about every single thing you do? Are you ever worried? Like if I cross the street the wrong way, is something going to happen to me? Like, do you think like that or no, 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 not like that. Um, you know, so I am, uh, I've been around people that are that that that, that do do some illegal things, and all I do is is tell them like, um, well, okay, so I'm gonna also this this area down here is is a is a like Tweakerville, you know, it's part yeah, of the country, yeah. and so guys, people that I knew before, you know, I know people that are mm -hmm. kind of, and the first thing I ask, I've got no desire that doesn't there's no desire in my in my world, done, really. and, yeah, so I'm I'm fortunate that way, and if, you know, I always say, you know, are you doing meth or is meth doing you? You know, it's like my thing I came up mm -hmm. with. But do I get worried? No, my wife gets more worried than I do. Yeah, which is I, no, because women, women, they worry. Yeah. So, so um, no, no, I, I'm good. That I'm not. Go, I'm not. I'm not going. Uh, I'm. I'm not going back to prison. I'm not committing more crime. I was always been a drug criminal. That's like the last thing in the world I ever did. You know, so, never. It's not going to happen. So before we go, I yeah. want to plug a little bit for you, but I want to play just a quick, fun little game with you before we go. Can go we play a game? I, sure, I think sure. this would be fun. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of people, and I want you to just tell me something interesting that you, you got to know them about or, or something that you can remember about them. Okay. Um, go for know, it. Just anything. Um, it. What about this individual? What do you remember most about him? Matty the horse. Uh, he fell down. He was on the fifth floor in the hospital, uh, and he, he fell down and busted his head. <laughs> I trip and he was like 89 at the time you can barely understand what the guy says and he had to, like a 30 year old girlfriend <laughs> what did she look like i didn't see her but i heard she was hot and she lived in he had her living in butner from what i understand listen she, I, I always say this about maddie we did a show on him uh fascinating individual yeah. one of the more interesting gangsters nobody talks about hey, but but again really really nice guy yeah yeah he i've heard i've yeah. heard um how about this guy so Sal uh, had to get, I had to fight somebody over him, <laughs> over him almost getting in a fight. Uh, it wasn't much of a fight, but I had to get involved. And uh, so he didn't like me. Um, he, one really? time they were having a conversation. It was Jojo and Greg De Palma and somebody else. In other words, I remember he made the comment like something about st stand over here and make sure the balls doesn't hit him. Like, like, you know, be a do boy. Yeah. And I, and I, uh, that's how me and Tommy became. Not, and I, I, don't, I don't know who the fuck you think I am. Yeah. And I burned off. And that's when Tommy Karate, which I've already met, came and uh, they apologized. And, and then Sal came and apologized to me later. But um, yeah, that, that happened. And, and what do I also think? He got screwed. He should have been let out of prison. He was dying. The judge wanted him out. He got burnt. I don't know. Yeah, if well, case, he got burnt. well, as I've said many times, uh, Sal Scala had one issue in his mob career. Uh, he knew an individual named John Gotti. That's okay. Why. So I mean, also that, that's, that's why, I mean, also, everyone in I, know, I know he was involved in the famous hit and I was under, I heard them talking about it and, and I maybe I got it twisted and I think I did. I heard him say, I thought he said he was the one with the gun jammed, but you know, that was I'm, another individual, but okay, yeah, okay. there's very much a reason to believe he was okay. involved with that. Okay. Uh, by the way, most of the people we've talked about today, whether it was Carmine, Bernie, South Scala, Ian Yellow, I've all passed away. Uh, we, we, you know, rest in peace to a lot of those guys. Sure, they sure. all have families. Um, they are all criminals, convicted criminals, and they all did, uh, you know, the things they had to do to survive. And sure. uh, we're really just talking about, you know, just stories here. Uh, sure. We'll do one or two more. What about this individual? Uh, Joey Testa. So Joey, the mayor, he's the mayor of wherever he goes. Um, so I've never, and I, and I know he's got family and I know the family are very supportive and you know what, as a grandfather, father and stuff like that, you couldn't being locked up, 
Okay. So if you had a father that's locked up or something, you could not have asked for a better person. He's very caring, very interested. I mean, just really interested in their lives. Do his, does the best he can as far as, as, uh, well, it's on my YouTube channel. I yes. talk about Joey. Testing, I, I want okay? you, I want I want everyone to check out Convict Inc. It, and I think I, it's going to be a great channel. I really do. I, thank I'm, you. I'm excited about it. One more person. I don't know if you know this guy, um, but he kind of relates to you in a little way. And I'm curious if you've ever seen it. Do you know oh. who this is? <laughs> yeah, Walter White. <laughs> what do you think? You were involved with that that life uh, at some point. Uh, as far as what do I think about meth. Well, what do you think about the show? Have you seen it? Oh, so, you know, I think it was a show, but so I never was involved in manufacturing. And really, yeah, like I said, more I, just wasn't, like the... I wasn't a meth guy per se. You know, I was, if, if I was anything, I was a Coke guy. Yeah. But like, so I did do meth in the end, you know, um, but like I went to prison and started doing heroin, you know, and I'm not a heroin guy, but I did. I mean, the first 10 years, I, I never used a needle on the street. I did in yeah. prison. Like, who, who right. does that? You know, right. but that's what happened. Interesting. Um, yeah. Last question, then we'll plug. Sure. Um, I asked this to Chad Marks, and, and I, I'll ask you this. Looking back on everything you've done since mm. the early 90s, the life you've had, the people you've met, the, the things you've done, the woman you met, let's say you go back to the 20-year-old you. Mm -hmm. Do you? Would you do it over? Surely, right? Seriously, think about it though. What I, your life is one thing. You've we've all shaped our lives one way. You look back at all the people you met, all the things you did. Uh, so would I do it over? Um, the twenty-year-old me, you couldn't talk to. Like I had it all figured out. Uh, so now, my dad just died here within you know a, a week or so ago. We still haven't had the service. Sorry uh, so. When when I when I look back at that and I and I and I've just said this on the, my YouTube thing. When I look back, they're they're going through pictures and stuff from Memorial, and I'm absent. I'm not there. You missed a lot. That's 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 what's like that that kills me. You know what I mean? Like I didn't know him, so I, and I don't know a lot of people, my nephews and stuff, because of that. But having said that, uh. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have that girl on there right now, you know, if my life would have changed. That's what I'm saying. Like you're so, you, you, things happen, everything that goes on in our life for, for certain reasons. Yeah. So it's oh, it's, it's hard to think hard about. Question. Yeah. Do you yeah. ever miss prison? Yeah. You know what? I miss you, the camaraderie, right? No, I missed it just I just told my wife about this the other day. I missed being able, okay. I, I'll tell you what I loved. I love sitting on my bunk high as a kite contemplating and thinking, thinking about how life would be on the street, thinking about how, if I was out, things would be, and thinking about the different things I had to do today, especially when I was in a leadership position in the game, meaning, okay, so I'm going to do, if I hit this guy, if I have this guy do, do this to this guy, what's going to be the repercussion? And plotting and figuring out. That was, to me, that was like, it was like, uh, uh, there was something in that that made me feel really good. Um, but but uh, maybe being in an environment that I can control, um, you know, by myself, that that warm feeling with opiates swimming through my body. And uh, I know it's just probably sickening to a lot of people, but it's true. But one, since since um, I'm noticing more so now than I did when I just get out, I have anxiety that I no, didn't know I never had. And I have a hard time making decisions. And I'm 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 more my temper is really short. And so um, I miss being able to be calm, cool, and collective and thinking things through because that's what I did in prison. I had to do that. I had other people that depended on me uh, when I was involved in gang stuff. And even right the two years before I got out, um, this administration in Terre Haute played uh, racial shot callers, uh, reps for the unit. And I was the, the rep, white rep in M unit for X amount of time, almost two years. So the decisions you make affect other people's lives. And I was able to do that more. And I was more relaxed and calm thinking that through in real life. I, I get like this, you know, I, I do. So that's one of the things. So I don't miss being confined, but I miss, I miss the person who was able to be calm, to make, to make uh, rational decisions.
But you know, the thing about this country and the good thing, there are a lot of good things yeah. about it, but there's one that now that you, you know about, there's people that can help you with all this stuff. You have a, a support system now. You have a new life for yourself. Yeah. You have a wife. You have yeah. the ability to not have to think about what would it be like when I get out. You're out now. Yeah. And you look at what you're doing. You got Convict Inc. Go subscribe. I'm going to put it in the description below. Please subscribe. This guy's got some great stories. Um, you're also working on a lot of other stuff. Your website, you're continuing to write. You've written for Vice and all these different places. You're actually getting into consulting, helping people that, so, let's say, God forbid, real quick, God forbid anybody watches this and they have to go to federal prison. You're going to, you can help them, you know, get along okay, what yeah. to do, what not to do. Tell us about that. Convictinc.net. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through every step. I know there's prison consulting uh, businesses out there. I've been researching them. I'm not saying there's some that is not really good, but I'll give you some tricks and secrets that nobody else I don't think will. I'm not going to tell you how to violate the law, but I'll, uh, I'll make your time more comfortable. I'm I, depending on, on each individual's circumstance, depending on what you want to do and who you are and what kind of crime you committed. Um, I don't think there's anybody that can tell you better than me. And I'm not just by myself. Uh, I've got some partners, also former lifers that we did time together. I'm not going to put their names out there. They also have their own individual businesses too. I do legal assistance. So I'm doing legal work. Um, uh, all of Legal assistance, I got to be careful. Now we do have an attorney that's getting involved, so it could be legal work then. But uh, um, 22 clemency petitions, um, compassionate releases, I, I got those down. As far as clemencies, I got a little insight on the clemency, a little inside scoop on the clemency stuff that I think uh, that I can uh, do better than most. Um, as far as writing, real quick, um, I haven't written since I've been out. I've been offered and I'm going to at some point. Uh, I've got some real estate stuff going on that. I never would have thought happened in my life. And uh, I've got, I've got, so what really what I've got is I've got too much stuff. You've got a but, bit of a potpourri of, of things yes, you're doing. Yes. Listen, Robert, it's only the beginning, man. Enjoy yes, your time. Yes. You know, salute, uh, good for you. Uh, yeah. I, I will beg you, you have to make me one promise. Uh, up, someday you will write a book about your life. Yeah. Because I think it's fascinating. Oh, yeah. Stories. Sure. 100%. Uh, I think it would be killer. Uh, no, I, I shouldn't have made that pun. I think nah, it's, it's, cool. it's cool. I think it would be a her terrific. Um, also, uh, make sure you, as I said, subscribe. Because Robert told me before the show uh, we recorded, he's got a really interesting phone call with an individual we actually yeah. spoke about. So yeah. um, you're going to have that coming out. You, you still remain close to some of these individuals. So yeah. um, we're excited about that. Listen, Rob, before I let you go, um, I've been doing – content i've been on youtube for i mean in the content business for a decade probably i can tell you anything you need to know about youtube i'm kind of like the version of you uh, except i know all about the internet and how to do stuff um this has been the most enjoyable conversation i've ever had with anybody i've learned oh, more in this yeah. conversation than i ever have i'm glad you were able to get in touch we were able to get in touch uh and i'm i'm hoping people enjoy this i i I think you're a fascinating guy. I wish you the best of luck. Maybe one day I'll meet you. Um, we can uh, break bread. Yeah. Good for you. So hey, thank you. I, re I really appreciate that. And anybody out there, I appreciate your support. I really yeah, do. Please support, man. We, you know, uh, People support me. I'm telling every single person that watches this, all the regulars, all the people that check in, please go subscribe. The description's below. This guy's going to be in there with the Chad Marks and all these different guys. This guy has stories that not a lot of people do about the guys we know about. So, uh, Robert, good for you. Salute. Keep it up. It's only the beginning, man. Thank you, bud. Good talk to you. It. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time here on okay. The Shutdown.